Hello. Hi. How are you? Hot? A bit. Everybody hot? Yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> right, we'll try not to put any hot air in here. Um, first of all, it might be just worth... You're both working on a, an interesting project together, aren't you? Perhaps, perhaps uh, you could tell us what it is. Do you want to start, Francesca? Yeah. OK, yeah, so the introduction, thank you, so the introduction is there. I also, I'm at Imperial, I'm based there as a researcher, but I'm also advising um, the European Commission on Information Policy and Network Policy since a few years. And me and Zmari are just a part of a big consortium throughout Europe with lots of interesting people, like, for instance, the founder of the web, Tim Berners-Lee, and different social groups and communities that are developing technology for social good. So developing platforms for social movement or citizens themselves to organize and take decisions online. So a kind of direct democracy platform throughout Europe and then linking decision making structures and decision making on the internet with new um, kind of economic empowerment tools like digital coins such as Bitcoin or version of Bitcoin for communities to share resources, access resources in a democratic way. So kind of combining the decision-making aspects of what technology can enable on a mass scale, so involving kind of uh, lots of citizens and, and grassroots groups, and then combining that with um, yeah, economic empowerment. So it's kind of very ambitious, <laughs> but um, uh, we're just starting. So we're taking actually lots of open source software that's out there, especially focusing on uh, decentralized social networks, because we think that's one big issue there is that they're creating this world garden with our data, our social and personal data. And I think one of the disruptive innovation in the internet is certainly going to be how to break that monopoly out and how people can you know, use privacy enhancing technology and control their own data to actually be in control also of their activities and what they do with technology and with their data. So that's something that, for instance, Tim Berners-Lee is really pushing for. It's always good having Tim Berners-Lee on your team, isn't it? It sort of shortens a lot of conversations, I'd imagine. It makes a lot of things a lot easier, I guess. Yeah, yeah especially <laughs> on the social standards sides, because at some point technology kind of needs some standards so that everybody can use it in an inter interoperable way. Yeah, and in the way yeah. that the web was uh, you know, a, a standardized way of accessing the internet, are you now trying to create almost similar, like a web, a standardized way of accessing the democratic process? Is that, is that part of the motivation, well, or is that a, a gross oversimplification? No, uh, well, if, if we think about how, uh, what kind of formalized decision-making systems there exist in society, there's really only two major ones. There's money, which is we use to express individual intent. I intend this for me. And then we have uh, votes, which we use to in, uh, uh, imply social intent. I intend this for society. And if we, uh, if we look at both of these systems, they're currently very uh, centrally controlled, uh, have very nasty features, like uh, characteristics that, that don't really um, help us, a lot of us, in, in a lot of what we're trying to do. So if we can try to apply more decentralization to these, uh, push the governance models of these out, uh, further out into the general public, then maybe we can start to get more favorable characteristics towards social change and, and social benefit. But I understand this, this project that you're working on is, is funded by the EU. Yeah. The EU. So, so is that a bit like uh, sort of Dracula funding a blood bank? Or, I mean, how do you... I, over, is, there a, is there a huge internal um, tension here I, where I, you're I being asked you know, to yeah. kind of break down the system by the system? Well, so there's, there's two ways of understanding this. One, on one hand, it, there's nothing wrong with taking Darth Vader's money as long as you're using it to fund the, the rebellion. <laughs> on the other hand... You can always tell who is a real geek, because it, it, it's, like, it's like seven <laughs> minutes in, we've got our first Star Wars record. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, there's, there's the fact that you know, everybody who is halfway realistic about the state of society sees that a lot of the institutions that are kind of Building, uh, have been, have been uh, underlying our society and maintaining our infrastructure and, and facilitating decision-making throughout the society, these institutions are breaking down really, really fast. And partially it's just because of their own institutional inertia coming to an impasse where, uh, where they can't really do anything anymore. Partially it's because, you know, time and time again, they violate people's trust and, and kind of break the social contract in ways that make people very antagonistic towards them. And, you know, all of this is basically running people towards a place where we need something different, and nobody's come up with a good plan yet. 
Yeah, I think, yeah, totally. I think one of the reasons why actually the Commission is probably funding a project like that is that they totally realize that there is a massive kind of breakdown of trust. <laughs> And they see that you have the young generation, you know, especially digital natives that are very much into the kind of ideas that the internet promotes, you know, radical decentralization, networks, transparency, civic rights, and all these things, which are out in the square, and they're kind of saying these institutions are broken, we need something else. And they don't know how to speak with these people. So there is a massive kind of deep politicization going on that of course is not something, you know, they realize that actually if they don't embrace these new models, they're gonna die. So I think one of the reasons, and, and for us, I mean, of course, looking at these kind of things like democracy, citizenship, trust, authority, identity, it's, not, it's very connected with information policy. So for me, there is a, the internet is actually at the center of this project for real democracy because actually you cannot disentangle anymore you know the kind of technological infrastructure and enabling collective intelligence from issues of kind of bigger policy but I think somehow, you know, today is kind of clear that we face a dilemma on one side and that we have to choose and this has to be a public debate, so it actually has to happen in the public. Do we want the internet that enable, you know, centralized system for mass surveillance as after, you know, the NSA revelation, it's clear that the concentration of knowledge and and power can lead to that kind of pervasive surveillance, or do we want to use the internet to enable new forms of democracy, decision making, you know, new forms of, um, you know, collaborative economies, distribution of wealth, and so on. So this is what we're faced with. And, and historically, to kind of break it out into a more historical context, because you know, a lot of people just talk about the internet as if it's just this new thing and completely disconnected from everything else that's ever happened. But in reality, it does fit into uh, the kind of social political history of the last uh, several hundred years in that uh, before the Industrial Revolution the, the big dichotomy of, uh, of the political discourse was uh, the, the extent of monarchic rule. Then that kind of got dealt with in most places but not everywhere completely. But then the Industrial Revolution came along with its uh, question of do we want to empower individuals or collectives? Do we want individualism or socialism and so on? And that's been kind of moving forward and since the 1940s people have mostly stabilized around the idea of uh, what, <clears throat> what we're now seeing breaking down as the kind of welfare state. But now, with, with the internet and, and communication technology, people are saying, well, you know, uh, do we really want this to be decentralized uh, centralized the way it has been, or do we want to decentralize it? And, and it looks like for the next 200 years or so, that, uh, that question of centralization versus decentralization is going to be the, the core political dichotomy. So now we've started to see some ex uh, experiments at, at creating the kind of decentralized political models. Um, pirate parties have been popping up here and there, and, and people have been experimenting with things like Bitcoin. And all of these things are kind of pushing in a decentralization direction, but nobody knows exactly what we're going to stabilize at. So you, you're kind of seeing this actually as, part, as a sort of a natural progression of history, a kind of increasing decentralization from sort of monarchic rule to, to a representative government and now the next stage. But we, we don't know what it is, but we can at least tinker around. So, so I'm going to ask you both a question now, which is what is the, the, one of the big questions that you're asking yourselves individually that's the one that's really kind of vexing you and making you think, I, this is, I've got the right question, but I'm, I'm a little bit, I still don't know how to find the answer. What's the, what's the thing that's really doing your head in? Um, yeah, I, I mean, certainly one question which we touched upon a little bit is, I think what we're seeing is a lot of refusal of the current institution and the current organizational forms and decision-making structures and the structure of our society. And this is very clear, I mean, also in the talk before, but throughout this conference, you know, you show, for instance, global movements that say no to dictatorship, like the Arab Spring, or even in Europe, you know, big wave of movements reclaiming kind of public spaces, reclaiming access to politics, you know, like the indignados in Spain, or the wave of mobilization in Brazil. So it's very much, uh, you know, people that are kind of reappropriating the political space, but also it's a big no to what we have now. And uh, to use a frame that I really like from Hart and Negri, they call this a destituent power. Basically, you say no to the current institution. 
So what I think it's really interesting is how that turns into a constituent power. So what actually I'm interested in is not like the info constitution of the future as a formalized constitution, but a constituent process from below. So almost a kind of social constitutionalism. So how do we enable collective actors to actually gain power and what would be that form? So basically how we create institutions for the future and, and, and through what process? So this ties into a point that, that um, was raised a bit earlier this afternoon, that if you protest, you're being defined by the system you're protesting against. Yeah. So are you kind of saying that people are, that there is a need for, clearly for a more collective governance. Yeah, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't well, agree with that. I think actually that it's not just that. I think that already if we look at the way that, uh, for example, grassroots groups organize themselves, the information movement being one of those, you know, if we look at, you know, Wikileaks or Anonymous or the Pirate Party, but also, you know, this kind of global movements, you already see the germs of some experiments, which are experiments of radical democracy, I would say, but they're temporary. So they're not, you know, they're not, they're, they're something that comes up and then go away. Mm. Uh, and so it's like how to uh, kind of empower those forms to, be, to become something. Um, yeah. So it's a bit like the, the, you know, Alexander Fleming sort of, you know, mold. How do you cultivate that and turn it into penicillin rather than just being an, a an accidental mold on the gel kind of thing? Yeah. Well, and so I'm, I'm always kind of uh, find it slightly ironic to talk about constitutionalism in the UK, uh, <laughs> but uh, but you know here we are in doing that, and and I think that the best way to do that, uh, given you know constitutional history and then the history of of the internet, is to not talk about about it as a as a legal framework, but rather as a protocol framework. That is to say, um, you know, on the internet we have communications protocols, we have ways in which we talk to each other to facilitate the types of interactions and transactions that we want. Um, so, you know, Marx talked about the uh, proletariat. Why, uh, we now should be talking about the protocolitariat, the, uh, the general public who, uh, you know, every day, uh, throughout every action they're taking, they're interacting with telecommunications networks uh, using a, a whole host of protocols. And for the most part, they have no control over them. Uh, if we take the, the means of, of protocolized production and put it into the hands of the general public, then a lot of the decision-making processes kind of come out of that in a fairly natural and organic way. The tricky bit is that, you know, while, while some people have been, like, uh, doing revolutions in this country, that country, and, you know, uh, doing all sorts of experiments with political parties and, you know, uh, uh, decentralized alternative currencies and that kind of thing, uh, the other 98% of humanity is sitting at home, uh, seeing you know a steady stream of news on uh, on the telly, saying that you know the U.S. government's been spying on everybody and, and they're doing it. Uh, if you do the math, it comes out to about 13 cents per person per day that it, it costs to do all of that surveillance, and uh, and they're doing you know this uh, so extensively. And there's not really a lot that the general public feels that they can do. So we're in a state of absolute disempowerment, and most people just change the channel because it's a lot more comfortable to watch something half brainless than than to have to deal with the reality of, uh, of living in a world where you have no uh, actual um, ability to do anything of, of meaning. Okay, I, well, actually so, so if better, I, I actually have a better um, thing for the constitution in the UK, which is thinking about the Magna Carta, which is the Bill of Rights. Because hmm. I think that what we're advocating here is a kind of Magna Carta contract for the digital age. So it's a kind of zeitgeist of the digital age, which I think it's missing. Because when the social contract breaks down and you have nothing to replace with, you also feel powerless yeah. and you have no ability to actually act. Um, so, so basically, you're, you're, you're basically trying to turn the Rebel Alliance from a bunch of people sitting in front of the TV into 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 Jedi's, essentially. <laughs> I, I, I would Jedi's. not use that uh, comparison. Wow, if you would use it, I, mean, I really didn't like those movies that much. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, really, it's the fact that you know a lot of people are, really want to do something, really feel passionate about, uh, about doing something. But unless there happen to be ten thousand people on the street outside, they're you know they generally feel very disempowered. So this is how quite do we, how this we is, yes, the this is quite depressing then, isn't it? Really, well, it's, it's very depressing. So, so well, I mean, I mean, you have also stories like, for instance, I'm Italian. I come from Rome. Um, and actually, in Southern Europe, the situation looks really tricky. Like, if you look at Greece, like, people are actually stopping taxes. 
So, you know, and, and then there is a rise of kind of extremism, you know, like um, right-wing political parties and nationalism. I mean, all kind of values and, and, and forms that are totally the opposite of what the internet generation and what we're advocating here. So I think, I think there is that breakdown and, and, and I think, you know, you have to actually come up with a plan yeah. uh, if you want to avoid to go in that, in that direction. Yeah, very, very often the price of criticism is an alternative. But, uh, you know, even if you don't have an alternative, going out onto the street and doing something is often better than just sitting at home. Now, the question is, how, how do we, you know, create the tools that allow people who uh, are currently sitting at home to feel better about, you know, their op options for what to do? Uh, a new Magna Carta for the internet might be a, a good start, but we also need to build the protocols, build the institutional frameworks that will allow people to actually directly influence what's happening. And that comes down to two things. First off, people need to know what's actually going on in society. If we don't know what's going on, we can't actually criticize it. Secondly, you need to give people a say. So it's information and participation capacity. If we don't have either one of those, it's all going to break down, uh, especially if you have the information but don't have the participation capacity, everybody's going to get a bit depressed. And you know, if you give people the participation capacity and not the information, then they're going to make even worse decisions than the people in, in Parliament. And you know, we know all uh, what that's going to look like, right? OK, so we've, 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 got another, we've just got two minutes before we end this session. And indeed, uh, this, uh, well, I'm pretty much future soon. first. So, so one of the things I'm going to say is we can't make a better future until we can imagine it. Of course, it's very hard. So I'd like to give you a minute each just to imagine what you think would be a great solution to the problems that you're dealing with. Oh, no, I mean, I actually don't like this thing that you ask the expert to come up with the solutions because it would be always almost wrong. <laughs> so I think actually what we're advocating is to open up this debate. It's almost like when you want to open up actually something like lawmaking or policy making, they used to be very, very close, what happens? So this is the type of experiments we want to engage with. So there is a lot going on, I think, in this field. I mean, if we take the Icelandic constitutional process that my was involved, I mean, people are actually giving feedback and participating online in rewriting a constitution. This is a great example. There are lots of examples of crowdsourcing lawmaking where citizens can collaboratively, through a wiki, write laws, and then you get 50,000 signatures, and that gets discussed in the parliament. Then you have kind of citizen-led ref referendum that are actually through the internet gaining much more friction now. You have something like Marco Civil of the Internet, which is the most advanced piece of legislation we have, a kind of internet uh, constitution in, in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. yeah, so um, I think we are getting to a point where we have a lot of uh, different type of experiments. I mean, I kind of advocate almost a scaling up and the federation of these experiments, so to bring them to a different level. And I mean, I'm thinking Europe for this point, but it should be globally, uh, a global process. So okay. the, the other thing, you know, if we, if we look at you know, the kind of long-term vision, um, currently we have a very centralized society where, where relatively few people are, uh, have the decision-making potential. Um, you have a fixed number of people in Parliament, no matter where you are in the world. You, in San Marino it's 60, Iceland it's 63, here it's 500, 573 in the US. Uh, why do we have to have these fixed numbers? Uh, the, there's a historical reason, which is uh, there were only a certain number of people who had the economic and, and logistic capacity to actually attend these big forums. But if we look at today, everybody has this amazing communication device in their pocket that allows them to instantaneously engage with most of the world. Why don't we try to build scale-free alternatives to, to the uh, current representative democracy model that allows anybody to participate who wants to, but still uh, take into account the fact that we need to not punish people for non-participation? Non okay. So that's kind of, you know, I'd like to go there. Brilliant. Well, look, we're, we're, we, we, we run, out, run out of time, so uh, I <laughs> just want to thank you very much. But one thing I will ask you both to say is uh, all the people in this room here who you are now sat in front of as you try to hack our democracy to make it more useful. What, what one thing would you ask them that they might want to take away or do when they leave Future Fest? <laughs> don't, don't ask us. Look, this doesn't like, work unless do. all of it is work just, together. Just do stuff. <laughs>
<laughs> do what you feel, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, okay, don't change the channel. Keep working, fix things. You know, you know, be empowered. So this goes back to the sort of the whole Please. theme, which is actually we all we are all well, like, citizens. Get, get more empowered. I think that's yeah. the yeah. message. Yeah. Like certainly in our future, something like the NSA, it would not exist. I mean, first of all, you sh we should stop this kind of things from happening. Okay, we're going to have to leave there okay. because people are very hot. But can you give a round of applause for Francesco Smari? Thank you.